Hi guys and welcome back to the Bird Photography Show with Glenn Bartley. Hello everybody. And me, Jan Wegener. Today's show is all about where to go for your next photo shoot. But there's no point going anywhere if you don't have the right gear, is there? There definitely is not and that's where Today's sponsor comes in. Camera Canada is your go-to source for all your camera needs. They're always my go-to spot for all my camera needs. They understand bird photographers, they understand our needs, and they're gonna give you fair prices, fast shipping, and get you the gear that you need quick. If you're in North America, head on over to Camera Canada, and you can use the, the promo code BIRDPHOTOSHOW to get a special offer or some special treatment from the guys over there. And we link that store for you down there in the description. So now that we've all the gear, Glenn, where do we go? And what are some of your favorite spots in the world that you would want to share with people so they can take some amazing bird photos? Before we talk about our favorite spots that we've ever been or where we really would, would recommend people go, it's important to think about why it is that you're going somewhere. It often starts with like one species that I really want to see or photograph. It might also just be, you know, a country or something like that. But for me, it's often about a certain species. It's just such a cool bird that I'm dying to photograph. And then my sort of planning starts to happen from that. It's definitely important if you want to get the most out of your trips to decide, am I just happy to walk around, drive around, look for some birds? Or am I targeting specific birds? Because if you're targeting specific birds, you need to find out in advance, how can I find these birds? Where are these birds? And how do we actually find those birds? We've talked a lot about sort of how we go about finding birds in some of the past episodes, but in a nutshell, there's some amazing resources online. We definitely always recommend eBird. That's a great resource to find out where the birds live. And also looking at sort of trip reports, I've recommended a webpage called Cloud Birders in the past, which is a great way to look at trip reports and see where you can find some of these things. Another thing to consider though, and then sometimes this can actually be really hard to sort of get a true sense is like, are these birds even gonna be photographable? Because some birds are beautiful, spectacular. You see them in the field guide, or maybe you see somebody who got some really, you know, perfect opportunity to photograph them, but the reality might be very different. And that can be hard to sort of decipher before you go on a trip. So in these cases, it's always good to actually try and find out where those people that have the cool shots may have taken those birds. Are there any bird feeders? Is there any water sources the birds come to? Because if you go somewhere, you have limited time, you don't really want to chase a bird through the rainforest for three days. If that's your thing, you can do that, but you will likely not come home with a lot of great images. And generally, if we go to a new area, we'd like to get a lot of new species, a lot of nice photos. And whenever I travel somewhere, I always try to find spots with like, tame birds that are accustomed to people. For instance, my cassowaries the other day, it's a spot that they sometimes venture onto the beach. So you have a much better opportunity to photograph them than finding them somewhere in the middle of the rainforest. I will go for some of the harder stuff, some of the real field photography stuff, but I'll also try to make it that every day I kind of have like at least one option where there's like some you know, really good chance of getting some great shots. So maybe like we, like you said, some feeders or something that's sort of a bit more reliable. So that's like a good way to sort of plan your photo shoots if possible. And I think even planning ahead maybe many years in advance might be beneficial because for instance, on my last road trip, there was one bird that I wanted to photograph for a long time. It's actually one that people don't really know what it is. It's kind of an in-between between, between two species. I was in the area and I read just a, a name, Herbiton, because they're called Herbiton honey eaters. But when I read Herbiton, I thought, didn't I screenshot like a Herbert and Honey Eater many, many, many years ago? So I went through my phone back to like 2012 and saw these screenshots of these Herbert and Honey Eaters. I'm like, oh, I am in the right area. I'd like to photograph these birds. And then I went on eBird and I found some sources of sightings there. And then actually the next morning I went there and I was able to get one photo I was pretty happy with. And what's one of your favorite or most recommended places that you've ever been? One destination I think everyone has to visit at least once in their life would be Florida. Simply because you can just fill all your memory cards you have with you every single day. There's just birds absolutely everywhere. There's no, no fear. They're on the beach. There's tourists on the beach. They're, literally, the birds will just be stepping over people. And oftentimes, in other countries, you were like, oh, I never have enough focal length. Or it's hard to take like a portrait of a bird or full body shot. There, you basically, if you want to have a portrait, you just walk closer to the bird. If you get a wider shot, you just walk backwards and the birds just don't care at all. Sounds like a really great place to learn and to kind of get started in bird photography. 
Absolutely. And you can also learn to photograph shorebirds because the water is quite warm. So you can actually walk into the water, be in the water with these reddish egrets fishing, for instance. So Fort Desoto Beach was one of those areas that I loved visiting. There was just birds everywhere. Fort Myers Beach was another area. And so it's just fantastic. It's not the most sort of unique or rare species, but if you want to learn, if you want to have a blast, it's just an absolutely fantastic area to just fill all your memory cards every single day and just have a lot of fun in the field. That's always that's always a fun shoot when you're just you're taking lots of good high quality images and like I said especially if you're just getting started out and you just want to have that repetition of taking lots of frames sounds like a great spot to visit. Absolutely. So Glenn, I've been looking more through your hummingbird book as well and there's just so many epic shots of hummingbirds in here mostly taken by you. So where do I go if I want to just have a blast, take a lot of epic different hummingbirds. If you've never been to the Neotropics, I think Costa Rica is a great place to sort of dip your toe in the water. It's a really beautiful country, really great people, nice food, and it's quite easy to travel around. Ecotourism has been a thing there for a long time, and it's very comfortable. It's not sort of like hardcore traveling at all. There's like 40 species, something like that. I can't remember the exact number in Costa Rica, but there's definitely plenty to keep you busy. And then you can graduate on to some of the other countries down further in the Andes, where in some countries you have like 130, 140 species and some really amazing ones. From what I've seen, Costa Rica seems relatively easy as well, because there seem to be like a lot of lodges where you can actually go to and there's feeders. So in that sense, it's not as hardcore some of the other things you've done probably and maybe even for older people or something it's something that's still quite accessible and maybe the climate is not so extreme either yeah i mean it's just a great pleasant trip it's a pl great place to go that's why i lead photo tours there every year there's great birds great hospitality good food nice people like what more do you want it's again it's sort of like that intro step into that neotropical birding there's a lot more to see out there but if you haven't been to the neotropics and photographed toucans and hummingbirds and trogons and all these amazing birds then costa rica is a great place to start another place that i actually loved and i lived there for a while is kind of your backyard glen because i lived in vancouver for about six or eight months and i also visited vancouver island a few times that's actually when glenn and i met for the first time and photographed together and if you just want to have a blast photographing some amazing ducks i think that sort of Vancouver, Vancouver Island area in the winter month is amazing because there's just hundreds of thousands of ducks everywhere and they're relatively approachable. All the waterfowl from the middle of North America goes out to the coast in the winter because the middle is frozen. There's no water. It's all completely iced over. Over here on Vancouver Island where I live in Victoria, there's some really beautiful, fantastic opportunities for, you know, harlequin ducks, wood ducks, pintails, um, you know, lots of other different species of waterfowl. And they, the thing that's kind of cool about it is they get really tame because people feed them. They're often on golf course ponds or little lagoons and things. And so it's a great photo opportunity to learn to, to take those really nice portraits, but also to get good flight shots and stuff like that. So it's a really cool place to visit if you want to work on your flight shooting skills. We always talk about sort of opportunities where you also get repetition. If you want to get good at flight shots, that's like the perfect mm -hmm. spot because the birds fly from the left to the right all day long. So you have a lot of opportunities yeah. to get good. And the other place I really like was that rifle bird sanctuary. It's all these little ponds. Mm, yeah on the Vancouver side, but basically any pond in Vancouver has tons of ducks on it. It's totally crazy. Yeah. So you can get some really nice shots very easily. And I, I had a blast just photographing all these different ducks. Now, we, I mentioned when we were talking about Costa Rica that it's the tip of the iceberg. And then as you want to dig deeper into South America, things get even more exciting. And I have to say that for me, if I had to sort of just only photograph one place for the rest of my life, it would probably be in like the cloud forests of the Andes, probably Ecuador and Colombia especially. That's one of those places where you have like well over 100 species of hummingbirds, amazing tanagers, mountain toucans, so many cool birds, ant pittas, ant birds. There's so much to see. And so I think if you've already been to Costa Rica, but nowhere else in the Neotropics, definitely want to take a look at Ecuador and Colombia as maybe one of your next photo destinations. And if someone wants to go to those places, is that where you would recommend to go like on a tour? Is this something you can do easily by yourself as well? I know a lot of people go to like Costa Rica and Ecuador, but what about like Colombia? I always heard all these things like it's a little bit more <laughs> dangerous maybe. Like is there a lot of benefits just going with someone that knows where to go basically? 
if you don't speak Spanish, it's just harder to get around. Obviously, like in Costa Rica, a lot of people speak English, but as you get further into Ecuador and Colombia, it's like definitely less, less English is being spoken. And so if you don't speak any Spanish, of course, that can be a little bit more challenging. The other thing though, that might make sense, and obviously, of course, I lead tours to these places, but I'm not trying to be just a salesperson here. But the reality is, is I've spent months and months and months in those countries, some like more than a year in most of these countries. And so, if you only have 10 days or two weeks or something like that, and you wanna go and have a really productive shoot, you, you could do it yourself, but in that much time, you're not gonna be as productive. In some ways with the workshops, you're paying of course for the expertise and the knowledge and to learn things, but you're also paying for the efficiency of sort of getting a really nice portfolio in a shorter period of time. Sounds like I'll have to go there one day and we have to film a bird photography somewhere in the cloud Sounds forest great. of Colombia. We should do that. We should definitely do that. The last place that I love photographing in is actually Australia. And I almost have to mention the whole of Australia. And I think people always have the wrong sort of perception of Australia because it always looks like I find a lot of tame birds. But I do feel like Australia is quite difficult when you want to photograph, especially if you just plan a trip by yourself. Because like, mm. most of the stuff here is field photography or you have to find some sort of half dry water hole to find the birds. There is some spots with birds, but overall, I always find it quite challenging. Like on my recent road trip, I found a lot of birds, but a lot of it was just tough field photography in the rainforest, finding the birds. Of course, there's some spots like the cassowaries or those amazing Victoria rifle birds that are a little bit more accessible, but they're hard to come by because there's no feeder sort of culture at all here. There's no lodges, only a handful of people are feeding birds. So I always find it quite challenging. Like, what did you think about Australia? I know you spent a little while there in Western Australia. We hooked up for a few days there as well, but it's, it's not quite the same as other countries, is it? You know these parrots like totally will go to feeders. So you'd yeah. think that like there'd be feeders everywhere, but it's not really like that. But yeah, I, I also on my list here was, was Australia. It's, it's a beautiful country with amazing birds. A lot of people don't even realize how big Australia is because it's often in the map, it's sort of down, kind of smooshed in the corner. Australia is like the same size as the US. It is a massive, massive country. And the birds are quite spread out too. So you have to sort of drive, just like Canada too, you have to drive further to get to a different ecosystem. So you're sort of in one area with that suite of birds and then you want to see different birds, you've got to go a decent distance to get to something new. And yeah, if you're doing field photography, then it, of course it's gonna take that skill level up to the next level where you really need to know your birds, you need to know the calls, and you have to have some techniques in order to try to get some decent shots because they're not just gonna be landing on the perch with some bananas in like they are in Costa Rica or no. hanging out on the beach like they are in Florida. It's probably not gonna be like that. The size is definitely a good point because people always come to me and say like, I wanna photograph like a Goldian Finch, a Major Mitchell's Cockatoo and something else. I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> about like 15,000 kilometers apart basically. So yeah. you always have to, in Australia, you basically have to pick an area. For instance, the Cairns area is always fantastic. There's a lot of different birds there, a lot of diversity so that would be one area i would focus on if you want to come here for instance and then try to find spots through ebooks through research just find some birds and there are some sort of lodges where the birds are a little bit tamer in that area as well but overall it's really picking an area first probably and then finding the spots yeah. that can work for you there so let's get right into everyone's favorite segment of the show the photo of the week and the pics that glenn and i picked this week and if you guys want us to look at your images and feature them on the show, make sure to tag them with Bird Photo Show on Instagram and we will have them in our selection and hopefully pick them and critique them. So what's your first pick, Glenn? All right, well, the first image that I brought for us is of this really cool tufted puffin. I know I had a tufted puffin already in a few episodes ago, but this one's in flight in a totally different environment. And CR Wildlife, I think, captured a really cool shot here up against the cliffs, the birds coming in. And it's kind of a neat that it sort of turned its head to the side. It got a good wing position, the feet coming out. I just thought it was sort of a, a, a nice, attractive, atmospheric shot from these, these cliffs up in the Pribilof Islands. What do you think? It's a very cool shot for sure. The pulse is epic because usually birds don't look at you mm -hmm. when they fly straight at you. So that's really epic. I can only assume it was probably pretty high wind and the birds kind of starting to land. It kind of looks a bit like that. And yeah. the one thing I would do here that I do on a lot of my images, I think if you brighten the background a little bit, you make a selection of the bird and then you only brighten the background. It could make the birds stand yeah. out a lot more. 
and you could also brush in a little bit of color over some of those really dark areas because i think at the moment the bird slightly blends yeah, into the background a, good point. a little bit so it's a really cool shot like it is but i think a little bit of editing lightening the background could really make the bird stand out more so the first image that i just had to click on and had to pick was by dj metcalf the female merganza with i didn't even count them one two three four a lot of babies <laughs> riding on the back and that's just crazy i think that's everyone's dream shot when it comes to these kind of morganzas with the baby it's not the lowest angle it might be taken from a boat or from the mm -hmm. shoreline but it just works because it's just crazy having that yeah. many babies riding on the back of the mum so i just love the light the watercolor is nice and blue it's just a really nice yeah thing. they were lucky for sure that the water was so glassy because then even though it's a little bit of a higher perspective it's okay if this water had been kind of choppy and like you know, broken up, I think it would have really detracted from the image, but because yeah. you have those clean, horizontal kind of lines in the background, it's it's really not distracting. And of course, you know, the moment or the, the special thing is of course, all these cute, looks like seven cute little babies that sometimes- I can't believe it can swim with yeah, it's Yeah, am it's amazing. I mean, that's what's so cool in some of these wildlife shots. It's It's the moment, you know, it's just this special moment of these little babies all trying to get up on the mom's back. And so really great shot from, from DJ here. The second image that I've brought for us this week is from uh, Aperture Mode. And it's of this pretty cool looking green heron. I don't know if this is a, a young bird that's just going into adult plumage probably. Yeah. And so it's still got these little like sort of fluffy juvenile feathers, but maybe it's even calling for like food from the parent or something like that, or just squawking. But just that really wide open bill. It's a pretty nice perch actually, kind of coming up into the frame on a nice little diagonal there and a nice sort of fairly pleasing background. So I thought it was a kind of a cool, a cool shot there from Aperture Mode. Yeah, it looks really cool. It could also be swallowing some gigantic fish and it's half choking on True. it potentially, yeah. but it's definitely a cool shot. The colors work mm. well. The next shot I brought is a Southern ground hornbill by, let's, I'll try to say it in German, Daniel Engelbrecht, because I wouldn't dare trying to say this in English. <laughs> But that was a shot that really stood out to me. It's an amazing bird. It has all these amazing facial details. Mm. And so it's destined to have a yeah. headshot taken of it. And I think this one is really well. The pose is really nice. You see a bit of the shoulders. You see that it has a long neck. It's looking right at the camera. The framing is really great. My only criticism would be, again, it feels a little bit flat to me. I know they might have tried to not brighten it too much because the top of those red whatever they are called on the bird's eye are a bit bright but i think if you make a manual selection here of the bird of the background of a few areas brighten the background slightly and also work on that eye area to make the eye stand out a little bit more i think you could take this great image and make it a true standout overall really awesome shot that i would be really happy to see that bird and take that photo and i see the last shot you brought us glenn is a Toucan, what made you pick that one? So this is, you know, really familiar kind of shot for me. I'm sure this was in Costa Rica by Choda's Visuals. But what I like about it is that it's not the sort of typical, you know, feeder setup shot. And here we have a very natural palm fruiting tree with some very ripe fruits. And, you know, we've got the toucan with a really nice pose with a nice ripe fruit in its bill. The eye contact here that it has the fruit, you know, it really tells the story and that it's such a nice natural setting, which to me, I will almost always oh, take yeah. a shot like this over a feeder setup shot. Don't get me wrong. I love feeder setups. I love doing setups. I love getting those really beautiful portraits. But when nature cooperates and gives you this beautiful plant yeah. and this very natural setting, those are always like really the top shots for me. You mentioned it already, but what really stands out to me here is the perfect pose. Cause I was actually photographing some pigeons feeding in a similar kind of tree, but I could never get a clean shot of it. They were either hanging down too much or the tail was covered by something. So in this case, I think it's quite unique to get a bird with such a good clean pose yeah. in such an open setting. I think the editing is also done really well. There's not really anything I could think of. The only thing we could think about, I know everyone loves to talk about cloning. Mm -hmm. Would we be potentially tempted to get rid of some of the stuff behind mm -hmm. the bird? Or does that take up, or does that remove too much of the natural setting? What do you guys think? And what do you think, Glenn? So I don't think I would take much away. 
But, so for example, if we look above the bird, there's those two kind of green um, palm fruits there. And then there's a small little bright yeah. stick there. I would maybe take that one and then there's a little nub and maybe the next one out. Maybe just to create a little bit of separation from that dark black back and have that background showing through more. And then below, I would maybe be tempted to take just that little one that's sticking out of its throat. And then those two that are kind of coming up to the lower mandible, just to create a little bit of separation. I think that's a great point. Oftentimes, even if you're in a little bit more busy setting, if you remove everything that actually intersects with the bird, I think that's what you're kind of trying to say here. The things that kind of stick into the throat at the bottom and the stuff that kind of goes into the head at the back, I think if you just remove that or a few more that kind of intersect with the bird, I think it will make it actually look cleaner and you're actually not doing much. But yeah. overall, the image might look even better, but it's already great as it is. Well, before we check out Jan's final pick for this week, if you guys want to learn all about cloning and how to make your images really shine, be sure to check out Jan's masterclass video, and my ebook on post-processing. And of course, if you want to get a great starting point, you definitely want to check out our pro sets because with just one click, they're going to take your raw file into a great starting point. So check out those resources and they will really help you to get the best in the best out of your images in the digital darkroom. And the last image I picked was the Swamp Sparrow by Andrew the Birder. It was just a nice image. It was a nice pose. It had a beautiful bright background. It had some nice light on it. And I thought it was just a nice natural yeah. shot. It just feels like the bird actually hopped onto a nice open perch. And we took a beautiful, nice, natural image. It's not, it doesn't feel like set up or contrived in any way. It just felt like a very honest, beautiful bird photo. Yeah, too. really nice light. I think the light really makes this shot. It looks like it was a, like a, yep. you know, slightly from the right, giving it just that little bit off angle lighting. It was, I'm sure like early morning or late afternoon sunlight. And then the mm. only thing is, it is like, I'm not super keen maybe on that light bit in the background. I would probably clean up the background a bit, but other than that, I think it's a fantastic shot. And on that note, I think it's time to wrap up this week's bird photography show. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give us a thumbs up for the video. And be sure to let us know if you're planning a trip somewhere exciting. Let us know where are you going? Why are you going there? Where do you want to go? Let us know your dream destinations down in the comments. And please make sure to also subscribe to the channel. And we will see you in the next video very soon. Bye, guys. See you next time, everybody.